All right. Hey, everybody. We are picking up with one of my favorite families of history, the Medicis. They are considered to be the godfather of the Renaissance. They were the most powerful family in Florence. To give you an example of that power, my 16th birthday, I got a portable CD player. And it was a pretty awesome gift. I mean, I was like, yeah, I can listen to music and ride in the car with my headphones on and no one can bug me. For Catherine Medici's 16th birthday, her dad bought her the throne of France. I still say my CD player was awesome, though. They made their money first as cloth merchants, but later, because they made quite a bit, bit of money off that, they became money lenders. Um, they also befriended the, the people that nobody wanted to be friends with. And that was a very smart move on their part. Very rich family, lots of connections. They end up with a couple of popes, multiple bishops and cardinals, a queen, some nobles. It's pretty impressive. You have to remember that even though they're very wealthy, they're commoners. They ruled behind the scenes. They didn't bother to waste their time directly ruling. Instead, they made friends, put those friends in power, and then told them what to do. They financed the Renaissance because they were patrons of the artists. And in doing so, elevated themselves. During this time period, the status of women does improve. Chivalry promotes respect for women. Urbanization creates more job opportunities. And you actually have the beginning of all female guilds because they're not actually allowed to join other guilds. Some women actually work the same jobs as their husband. And during the Renaissance, you have an increased veneration of the Virgin Mary because Mary symbolized ideals of womanhood, love, and sympathy. You have new architecture being built. Gothic cathedrals, for example. They're masterpieces of late medieval architecture and craftsmanship. They're very, very distinctive, guys. The arches, the towers, the spires, the interiors that are lit by huge windows that are generally glass-stained. Gorgeous. The men who designed the cathedrals, here's the thing, guys, they had no formal training. It was all trial and error. They learned their mis from their mistakes, and they created structures whose heights remained unmatched until the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and the invention of the skyscraper. These are pretty impressive, guys. They're still standing today. So, learning literature and the Renaissance starts in Italy in the 13th century. Why Italy, you ask? Simple. Wealthy people. You have a, not a single unified Italy. You have multiple city-states. And this allows individual families to rise up and sponsor artists. You've got urban growth and wealth. You have merchants who are controlling the scenes, not kings. So merchant class values. And you also have very classical heritage, guys. I mean, think about it. It's Italy. The main idea, you've got humanism. And it's a celebration of human life, the study of human beings and their potential. Maybe rules in life should be about what humans need and what they value and not what the church needs and what the church values. Because keep in mind, guys, Black Death inadvertently triggers the Renaissance. You have many different approaches to humanism, history, grammar, poetry, literature, rhetoric, fun times. So humanists and the printers. Scholasticism and the universities founded around 1200 focused on Greek and Latin texts and the Bible. But in 1350 in Italy, a new intellectual movement was created in opposition to scholasticism. And you've got the humanist movement. So you've got a number of early writers. Um, you've got Petrarch and Fidel, and they're giving speeches about humanism. And Cassandra Fidel was actually a woman. So for her to be giving a speech about humanism was pretty impressive. Petrarch also discussed his idea of early humanists, one of the first writers. And humanist scholars favored studying texts in their original languages and then comparing them to translation. Translations, you've heard the expression, oh, lost in translation. Well, when you're translating something and you don't like it, you can just leave it out. Why not? So two other very famous humanist writers, and thank you, Dante, for blocking my, my writing. That's awesome. 
doesn't matter. Dante and Geoffrey Chaucer were among the earliest and the most famous writers of the Middle Ages. Dante's Divine Comedy tells the author's journey through the nine layers of hell, his entry into paradise, and also his time spent in purgatory. And the most famous is Dante's Inferno, which is the, tr the journey of hell, because who doesn't love the horror, the gore, the danger, the sins? You also have Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and it's a very detailed portrayal of the lives of ordinary, everyday people in late medieval England. And that's not something that people had ever thought about writing or reading. The everyday ordinary. And if you've seen Seinfeld, this is about the everyday ordinary. That's what people watch today. That's what they read today. But this was brand new. This was This was revolutionary. Talking about ordinary people and even more scandalous the intermingling of different social classes unfortunately chaucer dies before he finishes the canterbury tales they never actually make it to the shrine of thomas a becket before he passes away of old age that's okay it's fine um but the point is revolutionary work of art if anybody out there wants to be an english major you will read the Canterbury Tales in its original format. So pace yourself. Fun fact also, Chaucer, it, through marriage, not a blood relative, but through marriage, is actually an ancestor of Henry VIII. Come on, you knew any chance I've got to work him into the podcast, I'm going to. Dante influences the intellectual movement of the humanists. They're interested in the humanities. They're interested in the classical literature of Greece and Rome. Virgil makes an appearance in the Divine Comedy, humanists had a tremendous influence on the reform of secondary education, but their efforts were not a complete break from past practices. It's more of a, a tweak here, a tweak there. In addition, here's the thing, guys. Books, many books are still handwritten. Some of the humanists wrote in the vernacular, most of them wrote in Latin, and a lot of them were working on restoring the original text of Latin and Greek authors and the Bible, again, by comparing them to the originals. And as part of this enterprise, Pope Nicholas V establishes the Vatican Library. Still there. Oh, just for what I would give to spend an hour in that library. The Dutch humanist Erasmus, we'll talk about why he's so important later, also produces a critical edition of the New Testament. And the influence of humanist writers was increased by the development of printing. Movable type, oh, I don't want to say invented. Movable type was recreated by Johannes Gutenberg sometime before 1454. Movable type was very suitable for various European languages, which were alphabetic. And printing made books very popular, especially the traveling narratives of Marco Polo. It really helps to spread new ideas when the Enlightenment begins, when we start talking about the scientific revolution. This is how those democratic ideas spread. This is how the Protestant Reformation starts, is the printing press, the new Bible. But... What you got to know, guys, here's the thing. Literacy rates don't necessarily go up because the lives of the peasants really aren't being impacted by the Renaissance. Nobody is saying, hey, you're people too. Let's get you in school so we can teach you how to read. That is not a thing. So the peasants still don't know how to read. But for the ones who, the, the people who actually know how to read, well, there's plenty of books for them. That's great. Anyway, Gutenberg began printing the Bible later on. And his press and more than 200 other presses produce at least 10 million books by 1500. Renaissance artists, guys. I'm not going to lie to you. My knowledge of artists is kind of limited to the Ninja Turtles. I'll pause so you can chuckle at that. Hey, that's not that funny, I know. Uh, 14th to 15th century artists built on the natural paintings of uh, Giotto as they developed a style of painting that concentrates on the depiction of Greek and Roman gods, as well as scenes from daily life. There's a big difference in the Italian Renaissance and the Northern European Renaissance, focusing more on religion, brighter colors, more realistic. Um, the development of oil paintings 
two of the most famous artists, Leonardo and Michelangelo. And again, the Medici's, they're the ones who are paying for all of this. They recognize talent when they see it. So traditional Byzantine art, and then the first European art, mostly religious, um, not, not a whole lot of bright colors going on. Nothing is drawn to scale as the people are roughly half the size of that building. And then the evolution, the Renaissance man. So the David by Donatella, that is a bronze statue commissioned by the Medici's. The David, Michelangelo, 1501, commissioned by the Medici's. But here's the difference, guys. The Renaissance man was not only strong and good looking and athletic, he was intelligent. He was kind. He was gentle. He was funny. He was well-read, well-versed. Leonardo da Vinci was considered a true Renaissance man. Now, here's the thing. The ideal man, that changed. Before, nobles, if you didn't have a lot of muscle, that meant, oh, you don't have to work. Good for you. But by 1500, the true Renaissance man was physically fit. So you can see... <coughs> pardon me, a couple of different, different things to look at. Number one, the helmet that is being worn with the sword. He has slayed the giant, uh, but he has longer hair. It's curly. There's definitely less muscle definition as opposed to David's Michelangelo. Shorter hair, definitely quite a bit more muscular. Um, in terms of the stances, because the way um, the David is standing, it is, he does appear a bit more feminine just by the hair, the stance, the lack of muscle than the David by Michelangelo. But the reason he is actually standing like that is because if the knee wasn't bent to distribute the weight, that statue would have caved in on itself. It is that heavy. As opposed to Michelangelo, that is made out of marble. If it toppled over, it would shatter everywhere, but it can support itself. That statue is also incredibly large, just so you guys know. Michelangelo. So Michelangelo not only creates this David, but he also creates the statue of the Virgin Mary cradling the body of Jesus. Now, one thing that Michelangelo was not... I don't want to say not good at, not skilled in, we'll say, because he's a very talented sculptor and painter. But you'll notice the the way that Mary is, is holding the body of Jesus. They've done the math. Mary would have had to have been eight feet tall to actually hold his body like that. So the idea of scale doesn't quite work yet. And the technique for being able to carve things to scale isn't there just yet. The Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo, the most famous, perhaps, here. Sorry. The most famous is here with the meeting of Adam between, here we got Adam, and there you have God. Da Vinci, the Renaissance man, guys. An expert at anatomy. The giant crossbow. The flying machine. He made a little robot, because why not? His self-portrait. Raphael, Italian painter, best known for scale, dimension, 3D. The School of Athens. Take a look. This I find very interesting. Da Vinci as Plato. Talks to Aristotle. Notice the direction of their hands, referencing their respective beliefs. Michelangelo was also painted in as a philosopher, and ever modest Raphael painted himself in. All right, again, quick picture of Portugal and Castile because Spain is now mostly united. We'll talk about why this matters in just a moment. Before I move too far on, I do want to just go back to Da Vinci, The Last Supper. One thing I love about Da Vinci is he's got hidden messages everywhere. So we're talking about Jesus. We are looking at the Last Supper. Christian, sign of the cross, Trinity, the three. Notice the disciples are grouped in threes. Boom, boom. Jesus has positioned himself in a triangle. 
which I found pretty nifty. And if you've seen the Da Vinci Code, this is the same picture where they discuss the triangle here and how this could be a disciple or it could be Mary Magdalene. I find that movie very interesting. But just wanted to point out that it is famous, not just because of the movie, but probably the most one of the most famous paintings in the Christian religion. All right, so why does this matter? When this is the la Granada, the last part of Spain to be united, Isabella of Castile. Look at all that. Again, guys, look at that beautiful kingdom. And Ferdinand of Aragon, whose kingdom was maybe half the size of hers. It's a love match. They get married. But unfortunately, um, in 1492, when Columbus is commissioned to sail, same year Granada is taken. This is really what is going to begin European imperialism of South America. We will spend quite a bit of time talking about that. Meanwhile, what all is going on with the rest of the world? We will spend an entire chapter on the gunpowder empires. The Ottoman Empire expanded its control in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially in the Christian Balkans areas. It uses slave soldiers by kidnapping young male Christian children to create the Devonshire system. These soldiers would be called Janissaries. And they're converted to Islam and they are trained to be the elite infantry. And this matters, guys, because we, when we talk about Ottoman expansion, when we talk about attacks by both and influence, the Ottomans have quite a bit of influence on what is going in and out of Europe. This is the reason, speaking of Columbus sailing to the Americas, European imperialism, guys, this is the reason. The Ottomans were controlling the Mediterranean Sea. Italian city-states and Ottomans have a deal. Hey, we can trade with each other. It's all good. We get along just fine. Europe had nowhere else to go. They didn't want to pay that special tax to the Mediterranean. So thus begins imperialism. But we'll talk about that next time. So take a minute, review at the conclusion, and with any questions, shoot me an email. Have a great night, y'all. Cheers.